know it's no pain, no gain Go hard till the end What's the use of playing a game If you ain't aiming to win my feet <laughs> Day, it's a pleasure. Thanks very much, Matt. Thank you for inviting me to be here tonight. When, uh, when I was first invited to, uh, to come tonight, I was trying to figure out what, what will people want to hear. And uh, one thing that I, I, I think people want to hear is, what's the secret of your success? So I, I thought back to other people that I've heard talk about the secret of their success, and I remembered that years ago in New York, I had a chance to hear Nathan Rothschild speak, and he was from the Rothschild family, which is this very wealthy European banking family. And people asked him, what's, and I was in the audience, they said, what was the secret of your success? And he said, well, I'll tell you, when I was in, when I was younger, when I was in high school, I went to a private school in the suburbs of Paris. Uh, I, I lived in the suburbs of Paris, but I went to a private school in the city. And I noticed there was a price differential between the city and the suburbs, that the prices were higher in the city. And so I had this idea, and one day I bought an apple in my hometown for one franc, and I brought it to the city, and after school I found someone to buy it, and I sold it for two francs. And then the next day, I took my two francs and I bought two apples, and I brought them to the city, and I sold it for four francs. And the next day I bought four apples, and I sold it for eight francs. And I did that every day for six weeks, until my great uncle died and left me 800 million francs. <laughs> so, so I will uh, give you comparable secrets of, of my success. I'll tell a little bit more about my background. I'm a career chief financial officer. I had started on Wall Street working for what was then First Boston, it's now Credit Suisse. Then became the CFO of several different companies, ending with Oracle until a few years ago. Now I'm retired, but I do work part-time with Bessemer Venture Partners, which is one of the biggest venture capital firms in the world. We have $1.6 billion of capital, and we have a 100-year history. We were founded uh, originally back to the partner of Andrew Carnegie, who far founded U.S. Steel, and the Phipps family, Henry Phipps, was partners with Andrew Carnegie in 1911. He gave $2 million to his children, and that today is many billions of dollars of investment capital, which is invested in Bessemer Trust and also Bessemer Venture Partners. And, uh, and then the other part of my time I spend serving on boards of directors. I'm on the board of the Priceline Group. Uh, who here has used Priceline uh, personally? Uh, Priceline Group also owns Booking.com. Anyone use Booking.com, the biggest and best travel hotel company in the world? We own OpenTable. People used OpenTable here. We own Kayak. People like Kayak. So uh, it sounds like we've got a lot of uh, happy customers with Priceline Group. I'm delighted to see that. I'm also on the board of Kaiser Permanente, which is a nonprofit. It's, we have 10.5 million members, many in California, but also around the country. And we're a health insurance and health plan, hospital plan. And it's uh, just an incredible. 60 plus year old organization that's made a big difference uh, to the lives of many people in California. I often meet people when I tell them I'm on the board of Kaiser who say I was born in a Kaiser hospital, I've had health care at Kaiser my whole life, my, my kids are, were born in Kaiser hospital, it's just great to see that kind of commitment and, and, uh, and from on the part of the Kaiser organization, Kaiser people. And then I'm also on the boards of a number of startups uh, and early stage companies. I specialize in two particular areas. One is enterprise software, like Oracle, uh, where you're selling software to, uh, to large companies, and that's typically uh, cloud software today. Uh, and then the second area is marketplaces. I think of Priceline as a marketplace. It's the largest hotel marketplace in the world. We have tens of millions of people who travel. We have 800,000 hotels and accommodations, and we make a match. Open Table is the largest, world's largest restaurant marketplace. Uh, and so when you have a marketplace where you have a lot of buyers and a lot of sellers and the company is in the middle, it can be extraordinarily effective and, and helpful in, in, for both sides of the marketplace. Uh, I think I, having uh, spent the last hour talking to a number of you uh, just privately before I, the talk today, I can guarantee that I'm going to disappoint everybody in this room. because. What you all want, or many of you want, is you would like Bessemer to invest in your company. And I'm sorry, but we're not going to invest in your company. And this presentation is going to tell you why. So my goal is not to be here to find companies to invest. My goal is to help share with you some of the things I've learned over the last five years about venture capital. And hopefully it'll make you a better entrepreneur and make your fundraising more successful if you understand what investors are looking at. I was talking earlier with some, some of the people uh, over dinner about Charlie Munger. Charlie Munger is the partner of Warren Buffett, an extremely wise elderly man now in his 
think 90 years old or over 90 years old, who has uh, come up with a number of sort of mental models in which he's talked about uh, widely about how he, he's been so successful and has, has made many billions of dollars in his lifetime personally. And one of those mental models is inversion. So if you have a problem and you think about the problem, somehow it, it, in your mind it makes it, 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 it's a better solution if you invert the problem and say, how do, I, how do I get the reverse of the problem solved as opposed to the problem solved? Somehow that frees up your mind and, and comes up with, and helps you come up with solutions. So if you're looking to raise money, instead of saying, how do I raise money, you flip it around and say, what is an investor looking for? And if, if, if I'm trying to find an investor, but there must be investors out there who are looking for CEOs and entrepreneurs. So how are they doing it? What are they looking for? And if I could figure, if I could understand what an investor is looking for, then I can position myself correctly to first of all find the right investor, and then position myself so that when I meet that right investor, I can pitch him or her in a way that he or she is going to say yes. So that's what this presentation is about. Uh, who here has heard about the concept of a minimum viable product? People heard that. So it's very popular now. Actually, Steve Blank, who writes a lot about startups, uh, has popularized that idea. And Steve and I teach a class at Stanford's Graduate Engineering School. So I have a presentation today that is my minimum viable presentation. And this is the first time I've presented it to a group. So I it's a, think of it as a run through. I'm very interested in your feedback. So you can give me feedback during in the Q&A and after the presentation. I think Day is going to send out an email. If you'd like to email back feedback, I'd love to hear about it. because. Uh, what I'm going to probably, you'll see there's no graphics or anything, I'm going to turn this probably into something that I publish and uh, I, I think of this as a first draft and I'm sure it can be improved with input from all of you. So let's start off by talking about uh, what are the, the key milestones and metrics and how do venture capital uh, people make uh, investments. And sometimes people look at venture capitalists and they say we're in the risk business. We're, we're willing to take a lot of risk on companies. It's actually not true. We don't want risk. Nobody wants risk. So the way to think about it is if you're a very early stage company, there's a lot of risk. There's a lot of unknowns. The more proof points you have, the more things you can, the more you start off with, with guesses and hypotheses about will customers buy my product, will they like my product, how will they use it. Uh, and over time, you develop data. You find customers, you start generating revenue, and you, you find distribution channels. And so the more data you have, the more proof points you have, the less risk for the investor. Then the valuation goes up. So you start off with a very risky idea with no proof points at a low valuation. And the more proof points you can add, the risk goes down for the investor and of course the valuation goes up. So that's the principle here. And what I'm going to try to share with you is some of the specific steps in reducing risk in the, in the eyes of the investor. And I apologize for the people in the back of the room if it's a little small to read. I'll, I'll read it to you. Uh, we, I have a number of steps. So I'm going to start with the first step. Typically, you all have passed this step if you're entrepreneurs, which is the idea stage. Uh, we believe that this product should exist in the world. I have this hunch, or I have this information, or I've talked to people. We think there's a, a gap, there's a problem. I think like, we can solve this problem. But it's, it's just an idea. It's just an idea. That's the first step. That is the riskiest stage the lowest value stage. I would bet that if you ask every single person in Silicon Valley, do you have an idea for a startup? They all have an idea. What percentage of those companies are going to get built? Very few. So you all think you have this great idea, but it's really not worth very much. So how do you make it worth something? And you make it worth something by going to the next step. And the next step is building a prototype. We can actually show you what it looks like. So. It's not only an idea, if, certainly if it's an app, I've actually built the app. It's really, now this is hard to do 20 years ago because you had to buy servers and hire engineers and cost you a million dollars to build a prototype. Today you can build a prototype by hiring a kid, kid in high school to program for you or you can do, build a minimum a viable product. And by showing the key features, first of all you're gonna show an investor the key features, but you can also show users and customers the key features and you will learn a lot. And I'd like to give you an example of my personal favorite minimum viable product. Uh, this came out of Steve Blank's class at Berkeley. And the student who was in this class uh, could speak and hear, but his entire family was deaf. His parents were deaf and his siblings were deaf. And having grown up in a deaf family, 
he knew that deaf people had a problem, especially uh, young deaf people, is that if you're talking one-on-one, -on -one, deaf people can, if they're adept, they can read lips, they can try to follow the conversation, but if you're, in a group of, if you're in a group of four or five people, they lose track of the conversation. They're talking to you, and someone talks over here, you, you sort of sense that people are looking there, you look there, by the time you look there, someone else is talking. So, in your group of people, you, you, you just stop talking. You, you can't communicate, you just go in the corner and you, you, know, you read your, 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 your uh, Facebook page or something because you can't interact with people. So, this, this young man desperately wanted to come up with a product to help solve this problem for his siblings. And his idea was, what if you could have an app on your phone or your iPad which would automatically translate speech to text? So I could just be watching my, my, my phone and I could see a transcript of what everyone was saying and I could see it would be color coded, you know, John was blue and Sally was, was red. Wouldn't this be a great way for me to interact and then I could communicate and talk when it was my turn? And he said, well, okay, how do I build a prototype? This is step number two, how do I build a minimum viable product? Now, to actually figure out to create speech to text software and to do all the engineering required is, is pretty complicated. He would have had to spend a lot of time and money doing this. So he said, what's the, how can I, that, that would be a viable product. How do I make it a minimum viable product? How do I do the simplest possible thing that can prove or not prove whether this will work? So here's what he came up with. He got four friends to sit in a conversation. They all had a telephone. He got four more friends to sit in another room on the other side, and each, each person in the room was on a phone with the person in, in the other room. And then he had an app, and all the app did was show so what someone typed. The person in the other room listened to the conversation and typed what they heard. So I was, if I was, Bob, I was listening to John, whatever John said, I typed it. And if I was Sue, whatever Sally said, I typed it. And with those eight people, the four people who were typing were a, a live, human-powered, speech-to-text machine. And he could then have these four deaf people reading the text with no engineering. And he could see whether it worked or not, and see how it worked, and, see, and, and modify it, and improve it. And so, with Zero cost, just getting four friends to help. He built a minimum viable product. He learned a lot about it. So that's sort of an example of how to build a prototype and a minimum, minimum viable product. Now the next category is you actually build the product. So you, you build a real product, you put it in, in people's hands, and you see whether they use it. So it's one thing to interview people and say, do you think this is a problem? If, you, if I gave you a product, would you use it? You know, you can get some information from interviews. You get a lot more information by actually giving someone a product and seeing how they use it, if they use it, by actually running ads on the internet, seeing if people click on the ads, if they give you their credit card numbers. That creates data that gives you a lot of information. So after phase three, again, you're reducing the risk. If you go to an investor and say, I built a prototype, I've got feedback, I've talked to customers, I have given them a product, I've given them the, and, I've, and I got data from the product because I have usage data and purchase data. Uh, the next category, number four, is customer trials. So it's not just a prototype, now it's in production. People using, are using it every day, or are they using it every day? Maybe I gave it to people and they used it once and then they stopped using it, or they're using it once a month or once every two months. That's a real, it's important to know whether people use something once a month or once a day. So you want to actually have, even if it's a small number of people, you want to have people actually using the product. Uh, and then you have metrics for people using the product in production. And then we reach proven product market fit. This is number five. So here we're finally at a level where I can demonstrate that people are using it and they like it. And my definition of product market fit in B2B for business customers is we have 10 business customers who are paying for the product, using it in production, and are referenceable. Meaning if a potential customer calls up the first customer and says, I'm thinking about buying this, what do you think? They're gonna say, this is fantastic, I use it all the time, you definitely have to buy it. Who here has heard of the Net Promoter Score? A few people? Uh, look up Net Promoter Score on Wikipedia, it's very important. What it is is, it's a way of asking people a question in a standardized way of would you recommend this product to a friend? On a scale of zero to 10, if you get a nine or a 10, you're a promoter. If you're zero to six, you're a detractor. If you're seven or eight, you're in the middle. 
And the math on the net promoter score is it's your promoters minus your detractors. So if everyone gives you a nine or a 10, you have 100, 100%. If no one gives you anything better than a six, you have a minus 100. So your net promoter score can range from minus 100 to plus 100. Apple is plus 50, very high. A lot of people like Apple. Comcast, minus 20. A lot of people don't like Comcast. So the advantage of net promoter score is thousands of companies use it and they ask exactly the same question exactly the same way. So you can compare your own customers over time and you can compare one product to another product. So when you have your 10 customers and you ask them that question in a standardized way, that gives a lot of information. Consumer is a different standard. If I'm a consumer paid product, I want to have 100 consumer paying customers who are all referenceable. That would be my, my minimum standard. If it's free, it has to be a lot bigger because if something's free, it's really easy to get people to use a free product and then you have to figure out how am I ever going to get money for it. So free, you want to see 100,000 monthly active users. If you don't have 100,000 monthly active users, you have not proven product market fit. You've just proven that you know, people can have tried something for free for a little while and, and tested it. They, they're, not, they're not users. So uh, the, this whole idea of a small number of very happy customers is a key, this is a big idea. It's a key idea in startups. Because there's always a temptation to say, well, okay, I have 10 customers, I want to get 100 customers, I want to get 1,000 customers. And the question is, are you better off with 10 customers who love you, or 1,000, or 10, or 100,000 customers who like you? And the answer is, you'd rather have 10 customers who love you. It's counterintuitive. You want a small group of people who think this is the best thing that's ever happened. And Paul Graham, who created Y Combinator, says, ideally, you want to make large numbers of users love you, but you can't expect to hit that right away. Initially, you have to choose between satisfying all the needs of a subset of potential users or satisfying a subset of the needs of all potential users. Take the first. It's easier to expand user-wise than satisfaction-wise. So, if you have people who love you, it's easier to, if you have 10 people who love your product in a B2B context, it's easier to find the 11th. But if you have people who sort of like your product, it's really hard to get them to love your product. So early on, you want to have a small group of people and just keep on iterating, make the product better and better and better until these people won't, they, they will grab it out of your hands and they won't let you go. So these are the first five milestones. And you can see, remember we started this concept of having high risk and a low value, you can see how every step of the way from the idea to the prototype to an actual product to product that customers are using every day in production to product that people are paying for and you've achieved product market fit, every step of the way you're reducing the risk for the investor and you're increasing the valuation that the investor is willing to pay and that you're going to earn. So the key concept here is thinking about it from the investor's point of view, what are they trying to see? Investors want more and more of these proof points. So let's go to the next, next level. I've proven product market fit. What do I need to prove next? Next, I need to prove that I can get customers cost effectively. And so I, have a, I, need, to have, I need to demonstrate that I have a proven go-to-market model. So the metric that we like to use is customer acquisition cost compared to gross profit payback. So let's say I have a product that costs a B2B product that costs $10,000 a year, a software product, uh, and it has an 80% profit margin. So I'm going to generate $8,000 of profit a year from that, from that customer. How much did it cost me to get that product, that, that customer? I had to hire salespeople, maybe I had to do marketing. I take all the sales and marketing costs that I have in a quarter, I compare it to all the gross profit I generate during the next year from all those customers I brought in, and I say, what's that ratio? Did it take me, is it gonna take me three or four years of profit to earn back my customer acquisition cost, or less or more? The metric that we look for is two years. If I can pay back all my customer acquisition costs, all my sales and marketing costs, on a gross profit basis in two years or less, that's attractive. If it's more than two years, you have not proven you have a scalable go-to-market strategy. If you're less than two years, that's great. Some companies we see are one year or even less or eight months, that's fantastic. So if you can sell your, if I can get that new customer who's gonna 
generate $8,000 of gross profit. It cost me less than $8,000 to, to sign them up. That's fantastic. I have less than a year payback, very good return. I've proven my go-to-market model. If I'm a business, a B2B sales company, and I have salespeople, are the salespeople making quota? If I have 10 salespeople, are seven or eight of them, 75% making quota? If I am, if they are, that's great. If my salespeople aren't making quota, I haven't figured it out yet. I still have a lot of learning to do on the sales side. So this is, so I remember the earlier stage, I have my, my product, I found product market fit. Number six is go to market. I figured out a way to have a repetitive, scalable sales process. Okay, now I have customers, I figured out how to sell them. Now the question is, can I renew them? Many businesses live on repeat purchases. A few don't, but most businesses, either I have a subscription, people are just renewing every year, or I have a product that people are buying time after time. So what I wanna know is what's my renewal rate? And the key metric here is a net renewal rate over 100%. So I signed up 100 customers, they each pay a dollar a year, just to make the math easier, so I have $100 of revenue. At the end of the year, if I had no new customers, what's my revenue? Let's say I have a 10% cancel rate, so I'm down from 100 customers to 90. Well, now, I've, now, I'm, minus, now I'm minus 10%, so I have a not, a not a great renewal rate. But what if those 90 people all buy 20% more? So they buy $18 more, so now I end up at 108. So I start at 100, went down to 90, went up to 108, all with no new customers. This is all just my existing customers that I started with. So I have actually a plus 8% net renewal rate. That's great. So we look for a net renewal rate above 100%. If you have a net renewal rate above 100%, you're growing with no new customers. If you have a net renewal rate below between 100 and 90%, you know, we'll take a look at it. If it's a lot below 90%, you're in trouble. So we all know about Groupon, how Groupon grew really fast and then exploded, imploded. Groupon had a terrible net renewal rate. Groupon signed up a lot of customers, but none of the very few renewed had huge cancel rates. For a while, they were they, you couldn't tell that because they were sending up so many new customers. You, the, the, the data on the old customers canceling were was invisible, but it, it caught up with them. And pretty soon, every small business in America was a former Groupon customer, and so uh, that's a, that's a key metric that anyone who looked at that metric would not have invested in Groupon at the time. So. That's uh, customer success. The next one is scalability. So what you want to see in a business is as you're growing, am I getting more profitable? If I have a business that starts off at a million dollars of revenue and I grow to two million and four million and eight million and 12 million in revenue, is my profit margin growing? And if I have a gross margin of more than 75%, that means that I have the potential to double and quadruple my revenue and not double and quadruple my costs. If I have a low margin business, if I double my revenue, I double my costs. Just this is math. So that's why software is such a wonderful business because software, if I can get a million people to use my software, the cost, once it's written, I have essentially 99 plus percent gross margin on the incremental revenue dollar I make. I may, maybe I have a little customer support or something, but, uh, but for, the, for, the, for the most part, I'm getting very high incremental profit on every incremental dollar. So 75% or more, Gross margin is important on scalability. Next is capital efficiency. Okay, I can build a company, I can build a big company, but if it costs me a lot of money to build a big company, have I really had a good return on investment? No. So, I, one company that I, I've worked with has, they're at, the, they're at a run rate of $5 million of revenue, they're about break even, they're growing 100% a year, they raised $300,000 and they have $300,000 in the bank. So. They basically have built a business, a nice small business, with $5 million of revenue on zero capital. That's terrific. So you, 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 there are many other businesses that you look at that have $5 million of revenue that have spent $20 million, and it's all gone. And so that's a much less attractive business. So you, you want to look at that ratio of what's your annual gross profit relative to capital spend, and is it more than 100? So if you're more than 100%, if you have a business with $5 million of revenue, uh, or $5 million of gross profit, rather, and you invested $5 million, then that's a, that, that would be an index of 100 if you're, you want to be better than 100. And then finally, proven market demand. You could make all these other metrics, but if you're still a small business, you haven't really proven that you're, a, you might be a, a small successful company, but you haven't proven that you can be a big successful company. 
And so the, the, the threshold, different, company, different investors have different thresholds here. The investor we look for is annual recurring revenue of $5 million or more. So we typically invest, this would be the, the sweet spot for Bessemer to invest, is a company with $5 million of annual revenue, where we think it can grow to $100 million in revenue. And at $100 million in revenue, the company perhaps can go public, or it would be a, a good uh, acquisition candidate for a much larger company. And if you already have achieved $5 million of revenue and you've may, met all these other criteria, there is much less risk for Bessemer. Because you've proven product market fit, You've proven you have a scalable, cost-effective sales model. You've proven that you people renew at greater than 100% rate. You've proven that you're capital efficient. There's a lot of proof points. And so when outsiders look at venture capital and say it's really risky, we say, well, there's risk. There are often times where we lose all our money. But if we invest in a company with $5 million in annual revenue with all of these other criteria, we, we have a decent shot at getting to $100 million in revenue. So uh, that's, that's what we're looking for. So uh, I'll keep on going. That's, these are the early stage metrics uh, that get to the stage where Bessemer is interested. And now I'm going to talk about the bonus metrics. So there's a number of other things. Uh, proven traction. Not only can you grow revenue, but are you growing revenue? Are you growing revenue more than 100% a year? So if you've got a $5 million revenue business growing 100% a year, chances are you, you found something. You found you know, people like it, you, 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 things are working well you're much more likely to get to 100 million uh, within a few years. Next is proven leadership team. There's a CEO, or maybe co-founders. There's a leadership team, head of technology, head of product, marketing, finance, sales, whatever the key, uh, design, whatever the key, key, key factors are. By the time we're ready to invest, we want to know that your entire leadership team is in place. If you have most of them, that's good. If you have all of them, that's great. If you're only two people and you have an engineer and a, and a sales guy, but you're missing the, uh, the HR person or you're missing some other key component, marketing person, you're creating risk for us and we'd, we'd, we'd like to see less risk. Proven market size. So this is a, a very interesting question. Uh, some venture investors, this is the single most important criteria for them, is I want to know you're going after a big market. Priceline, hotels. A lot of hotels in the world, a lot of hotel rooms. Priceline today has a 60 plus billion dollar market value, almost all from selling hotel rooms, and we have a tiny share of the global market for hotels. So we can become much larger than we are today just in hotels. So a large market is a very important thing to investors. How do you measure the large market? The metric that I use is what's your fifth year potential? So you take a look and you say, well, how many customers do I think I can get? How many customers do I have now? What's my revenue per customer? And that's multiply one time to the other, that tells me my revenue today. And then I say, you know, using some reasonable guesses, in five years, how many customers do I think I can have? What do I think the revenue per customer is gonna be then? And multiply one by the other. So we wanna see a company that in five or six or seven years can get to $100 million in revenue. So if I have a product that costs $1,000, I need to have 100,000 customers paying $1,000. If, if I have a product that's $100,000, I only need a thousand of them. So it's, it's very interactive between the price point and the number of customers. One way or another, I want to see that I can get to $100 million, and it has to be a credible argument. Next one is diversification, both of customers, partners, and suppliers. So uh, when I, I was the CFO of DoubleClick years ago, and a third of our revenue came from AltaVista. Uh, who uses AltaVista as a search engine today? So nobody, so that was dangerous to have a 30 revenue come from a search engine that disappeared. So uh, when you have customers, if you have one customer who's a third of your revenue, investors don't like that. So we want to, ideally you want to see no customer more than 1% uh, of, of your business. If you, if, it's not to say that it's a terrible thing to have big customers who are large percentage of revenue, but you just have to overcome it. It, it lowers the valuation, it increases the risk. Uh, so it's something which you want to, if sometimes you can't avoid it, but you want to try to diversify as much as you can. Not only in terms of customers, but also in terms of suppliers. What if you're an app and 100% of your, your revenue comes from being in the Apple uh, store? And Apple decides one day to you know, change your placement in the store. Very risky for an investor. So you want to have diversification of channels, diversification of suppliers. Uh, next question is product risk or market risk? 
different investors have different criteria here. So there's always risk. Uh, like an example of product risk is a company we invested in called Skybox Imaging. Their idea was to make small satellites based on pre-manufactured components that they bought off the shelf, and they would launch it in competition with the aerospace industry, which would, and Skybox would launch a satellite for $5 million, or build a satellite for $5 million, that Lockheed would cost $100 million for a comparable satellite. So the, we knew that if we could build a satellite for 1 20th the cost of the competition, we'd have a lot of customers. What we didn't know is, could we build it? So there was product risk. You didn't know if you could actually build the product, but you knew if you could build the product, it would work. If you could cure cancer, you're gonna have a great business. Hard to do, we don't know if we could come up with a cure for cancer, but you know, if you, if you succeed in that product, the market is there. Sometimes there is market risk. We were investors in Pinterest. Uh, when, when we first built Pinterest, we had no idea whether people would use it. We knew we could build it. We knew we could make a beautiful design that people would, that would like, they would like the, the product, they would look at the pictures, they would, but we didn't know whether you'd have 100 people using it or a million people or 100 million people using it. So Pinterest was, had very little product risk. It had enormous market risk initially. And sometimes there is, companies have both, both kinds of risk. Uh, the next one, timing. This is actually a really interesting question. You have this great idea. You believe it's going to work. The question is, why now? Why didn't this exist last year or five years ago or 10 years ago? If you can't answer that question, maybe you don't really understand the problem. Because a lot of people have ideas. If the technology has been readily available, uh, someone would have invented it. My, my favorite example here is Uber. Uber could not have existed until every passenger and every driver had a smartphone. And in fact, Uber started very soon after everybody got a smartphone. So Uber could simply would not have worked 10 years ago. And so you, you want to think about your particular product. Sometimes it's just that no one's thought of the idea yet. Or sometimes people have tried it but didn't quite get it right, and they didn't get product market fit, but you have a better idea. So there are exceptions, but if you can answer that question of why now in a compelling way, uh, that's that's very important, and, and often it has to do with technology shifts like smartphones or mobile or, or price. Sometimes the price of a component has come down from $100 to $10, and all of a sudden a whole group of customers can afford something they couldn't afford before. Proven product founder fit is the next one. How well do the founders understand the customer? So this is something we love to see. It's low risk if the founder is building a product for, for himself or herself. Where, the, where they are a user. So Mark Zuckerberg was in college. He built a product for college students. He understood exactly what his friends, he and his friends wanted. Uh, Salesforce, Mark Benioff was a salesman, an enterprise salesman. He knew what salespeople wanted. He had worked in sales organizations. Twilio is a product that Bessemer has invested in uh, to help with uh, developers uh, interact with telecom more easily. The founder was an engineer who had to work with telecom. He built the product for himself. So that's another great example. Proven technical advantage. Do you have some technical reason why what you can build is better than what someone else can build? If you do, very powerful. Google had an understanding of algorithms with their referral system, which was different from the way AltaVista was built. They had a better model, which worked better crawling the internet, and obviously it's worked extremely well. Palantir is a, is a local company that many of you may have heard of which has a better, it started off being the fraud detection technology at PayPal, and they have a, a very complicated but very high performing technology of, of analyzing big data. Uh, the next one is what about a competitive advantage? Do you have a unique competitive advantage that's proven? Uh, Amazon uh, has, uh, now that they have such huge volume, they have an enormous advantage because they're very low cost. Very tough to compete with Amazon. We, we, I, I can't think of a time in the last five years where we've funded any company that competes with Amazon because Amazon's going to win. Uh, Zenefits, it's a company that grew very quickly, it's had some troubles, but that category is a very interesting company. Their unique advantage is they're providing HR software for small businesses for free. And they get paid because they become their health insurance broker and they get a commission, but free is a very good price point. So if you have a unique business model where you can provide your product for free and get paid by somebody else, and no one's done that before, that's uh, that ter terrific competitive advantage. Uh, Blue Apron, 
uh, is a food company that we've invested in, which has, now they have very high scale. They can provide fresh food delivered to your home, cheaper than high quality food, cheaper than you can buy in a grocery store because they buy directly from farmers, ship directly to you. So they have a very important competitive advantage. And then finally, proven network effects. So network effects are very important in a number of businesses and the definition is pretty straightforward. It means once you have a certain critical mass of customers, does every incremental customer add value for every other customer? So Airbnb, for instance, uh, or mobile travel companies, Airbnb has a lot of hosts and a lot of guests, and every time they add another host, every guest is better off because it gives more choice to the guests. And every time they add another guest, the hosts are better off because the hosts get more money. So you have tremendous, these kinds of businesses are very hard to start because there's a chicken and egg problem, but once they're started, they become very valuable because they have this network effect. Uh, Shutterstock is a, is a photo uh, marketplace for professional photographers and businesses that buy images from professional photographers, same type of thing in terms of big network effects. So we came up with 20 uh, ideas about ways that each of, if you, if you succeed on each of these 20 things, obviously you have a very valuable company. So that's, no one's gonna get all 20. But uh, the more of them you can get, the better off you are. So next, what I wanted to talk about is from an remember, we're thinking about this from an investor's point of view. How do they think about companies on these 20 criteria, and how does that map into uh, seed and Series A and things like that? And this is, these are just rough numbers. They change from year to year. Uh, valuations were higher last year. They're about a third lower on average now because the stock market's dropped and, and capital has come out of the venture world. But I think these are good order of magnitude uh, assumptions. So seed is, the definition of seed is a company that's just started. Up to the point of achieving product market fit, they typically raise $100,000 from friends and family, maybe up to $2 million from a combination of angels and friends and family and maybe one or two seed funds. The next level is Series A. And at Series A, you've now proven your, 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 your goal is to prove your revenue model. You already have product market fit. You're now proving your customer acquisition costs and proving your go-to-market strategy. And you're gonna raise between two and eight million dollars. The next level is series B. Okay, I've proven my customer acquisition cost. My CAC ratio is below two years. Uh, now, but now I wanna scale. I wanna hire more salespeople. I wanna spend more money on marketing. Uh, and I'm expanding my revenue. And I'm raising between five and 15 million dollars. And then the next levels of series, C, D, E, and F, are getting from that $5 million revenue number to $100 million of revenue, where I keep on needing to raise money if I have a, a less capital efficient model. Uh, and here I can grow between, I can raise between 15 and 30 million, and then by the time I go public or sell at $100 million or more revenue, uh, I'm probably gonna raise $75 million in my IPO, or raise $7 million in a late stage financing or sell the company. So these are sort of just benchmarks you might want to use. So let me try to summarize, uh, again, answering the question of what does an investor look for? Investors specialize. So back to Charlie Munger, uh, Warren Buffett's partner. Uh, well, he and, and Buffett have this philosophy of saying, we want to invest within our circle of competence. Now, why an investor would invest outside of the circle of competence, that doesn't make much sense to me, but some stock market investors invest outside the circle of competence all the time. In venture capital, that's rare. Most venture capitalists know what their circle of competence is, which is very important, and then they have the discipline to stay within that most of the time. And so, if you're looking to raise money, either from a seed investor, or an angel investor, or a venture capital firm, what you want to know is, what is their focus area? And the focus area is defined by at least these three things, by risk stage, by market sector, and by geography. So some investors specialize in pre-revenue, or some specialize in pre-product, or some specialize in seed, some specialize like Bessemer in Series A and B. Some specialize by market sector. I personally specialize by enterprise software and marketplaces. Other people do Internet of Things or hardware. And finally, by geography. Some companies specialize in the US, some in, in Europe or in India, some just in Silicon Valley or just in the San Francisco area. So if you're talking to an investor who specializes in an area that's not your company, you're wasting your time. And one way to think about this is uh, a story my dad liked to tell me. A friend of his sold magazines.
to doctor's offices. And he would go into a doctor's office, and in a minute, he could tell whether it was worthwhile. And what he looked, did is he looked around and he saw, are there magazines on the, on the tables in the waiting room in the doctor's office? And some doctor's office had 50 magazines, and some doctor's office had none. And my dad's friend asked me, which one is a better prospect for you? And I said, well, the one that has none is better because he needs, he needs a lot of magazines. And he said, no. The guy's never bought magazines before. He's not going to change today for you. He's, this guy doesn't buy magazines. Walk, don't even talk to him. We'll turn around, walk out of the office. You're wasting your time. If the guy has 50 magazines, he likes magazines. He's going to buy a 50 first. So somehow that lesson stayed with me. And the same thing is true of investors. What you want to do is you want to find someone who has invested in a company that's just like yours. Maybe not directly competitive, but as close to yours as possible. And if you can find that person, they want to meet you as much as you want to meet them. Because they, they like the investment they've already made, they want to make another one. So how do you reach these, investor, uh, reach these investors? Uh, again, uh, flip it around. Let's say you're an investor. How do you want to meet an entrepreneur? What is the best possible call you could get? Reference call for an entrepreneur. You haven't met this person before. The best call is from the CEO of a company that you've already invested in. That's one of your successful investments. If, you got, if, if, if I'm an investor and I've invested in 10 companies, and five of those are doing pretty well, and one of those CEOs calls me and says, Jeff, I've just met this company. It's in your sector. It's in your focus area. I love them. I use the product. I think it's terrific. You have to meet the CEO. That, I'm going to I'm going to meet with that person. That's going to be I'm going to drop everything to meet with that person. That's the best way, the best reference you can get. So what you want to do is find companies that are like yours, that are venture backed. Get to meet the executives there, and if they like you and they can recommend you to their investors, that's the, the best way to get there. And then of course you want people who specialize in your in your stage, sector, and geography. Uh, there are some resources that uh, are helpful. Uh, there's a book called Venture Deals, Be Smarter Than Your Lawyer and Venture Capitalist. So if you're interested, if you're involved in trying to negotiate financing and figure out how to do that, read that book. It has a lot of very helpful uh, ideas in it. And then Y Combinator has made their documents free. So if you actually are raising money and you want to use the simplest kinds of documents for, convertible, for a stock, you literally can just go on that website, take their documents, and you can use them for your company. So that uh, concludes my presentation. I wanted to give you uh, a sense of uh, how I think about investing from an investor's point of view, and hopefully that's helpful for you as an entrepreneur and a CEO. And I'd like to now turn it over to you, ask questions. I'm happy to answer questions on anything you'd like. Yeah. Let's have the mic here. I'll, I'll bring it up. Hello. Sure. There we go. Question in the very back. Yes. Sorry. Here's the mic. Thank you for really a wonderful and clear presentation. Uh, the question I had was uh, when you break down the venture stages by risk and you say seed is startup to product market fit and that you're looking for. So that means that if someone comes to you looking for seed capital, you want to see that they have product market fit by that point before you consider giving them seed capital. Is that right? Or no, you that's, want the, it's, they don't have product market fit. So uh, okay. it, it was up to that point. So Got it. the people who, who are not Bessemer, who are willing to invest in seed companies, know that you don't have product market fit. They're giving you money. Their bet is with your money and no one else's money, you will get to product market fit. So if you raise a million dollars, your goal is to get to product market fit before your million dollars runs out. So the purpose of the seed financing is to take that money and achieve product market fit. Once you've achieved product market fit, you can then raise your Series A, which is, and the goal there is to reach the next phase. So think about each phase as you're raising money in order to accomplish something. And you, you need to accomplish that or else you can't raise money in the next round. Because if you, if you raise seed and you don't achieve product market fit, you can't raise Series A. So what do you do now? You're out of money. What, you might have to raise a seed extension. You might have to go back to your seed investors and say, well, look, we could shut the company down, or you can write me another check for another couple hundred thousand dollars, give me a couple more months. But if you haven't achieved that particular goal for that stage, you're, you're, you're at risk of losing the company. 
The next stage, if you've achieved product market fit and you raise $5 million for Series A and you hire a lot of salespeople and you spend a lot of money marketing and you grow, you spend all this money, but you haven't achieved a, a repetitive sales model where your customer acquisition cost is, has less than a two-year payback, you're not going to be able to raise Series B. Next question here. Hi, I'm Raj from uh, Blue Green Networks. Uh, so, uh, just fundamentally, I have a little uh, different disbelief. Uh, belief. Uh, basically, uh, why do we need to even raise funds? In your working, and you can fund the company and make the product work. Why do we need to raise funds? And uh, you, are, you are earning the money where you are uh, funding the company yourself. Right. When you can scale the company to a certain level, at that time, if it is self-funded, we don't even need investors. That's a, tr that's a very insightful question, and I completely agree with you. So if you think about, if your goal is to build a successful company and make a lot of money, and you start with two co-founders, you're down to each one has a third of the company, and then you raise Series A and Series B and Series C, and each stage, the new investor takes on 20% of the company. Even if you get to $100 million of revenue, at that point, you as the co-founder only have 7% of the company. And you know, maybe 7% of a big number is, is, a, is a big number, so that could work out, but maybe not. The example that you just talked about is Shutterstock. So John Oranger founded Shutterstock in the year 2000. He, he, had, he was an engineer. He had built a website to uh, sell ad blocking software, uh, which was making a little bit of money, so he had made some money. And he tried to buy images to put on his website to use for marketing. And it was very difficult to buy images. It was hard to find. They had to sign these long, complicated contracts. He only could buy the image and had license it for a limited time. He said, this is crazy. He bought a camera. He went out and he took 100,000 images over the next year, personally. He put the images on a website and he said, anyone can license these images royalty free forever. Just pay me 10 bucks per image or pay me a subscription for X number of images. And he started, then he personally went out and he bought Google AdWords and he got people to come to the site and he personally promoted it uh, to other people and he got people to come and start buying images from him. And then a photographer came to him and said, hey, I've got 5,000 images, I don't have a website, can I give you my images and have you sell them for me and give me a cut? And he said, well, that's a great idea. So we started adding other photographers. And today we have 80,000 photographers and we sell $400 million worth of images and he never took outside capital. So until he took it very late in the private stage, and when he took it, it didn't go in the company because the company was profitable from day one, and he took it off the table. So he now owns 40% of a company worth a billion and a half dollars that he personally started 15 years ago. So if you could do that, that's my advice. Most people can't write the code, do the Google AdWords, uh, take the images and do all that personally. The way John is just an extraordinary entrepreneur. Uh, and so most people have co-founders, most people need capital because their business model is not as immediately profitable as Shutterstock was. And there's a trade-off. Uh, but you, you clearly want to wanna raise as little capital as you can to get to that next level. Question back here? Okay. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. My name is Aparna. And one of the things that I saw was missing, uh, and I'm not saying this in a derogatory way, is lifetime value. Uh, I've seen some presentations where many investors ask for a CAC right. uh, over LTV. Um, right. uh, how significant is that? Uh, I, you're right. Mo many investors ask for lifetime value, and I don't quite understand why they do. Because if you're looking at a company that's three years old, and they say our lifetime value is seven years, it's obviously not true. Because you don't have any seven-year customers. Uh, so to me, if you have uh, a net renewal rate above 100%, your lifetime value is infinite. because if someone starts off at $100 of revenue and next year it's 110 and next year it's 120, you, you never lose them. Uh, and if you can sell it with a CAC ratio of, of CAC payback of less than a year, so if I can make my money back in, in one or two years and, my, and I have a good net renewal rate and by the end of two or three years I've made my money back two or three times over, those metrics to me are more valuable than understanding this theoretical lifetime value. Uh, just to give you a sense of Shutterstock, uh, Shutterstock would, if they spent a dollar on marketing for the entire first 10 years of their company's history, they would make three and a half dollars of profit within two years and still have, on average, the same revenue they had to begin with. So that's a great model. 
question in the front here. Um, um, probably a lot of people know the answer, but uh, so at every of those uh, stages of risk, uh, uh, from your experience, uh, what is the average stake you have to give up to get this money? Well, it's uh, the, the missing piece is the valuation. So uh, let's say that a seed, I, I've seen seed companies valued at $3 million, and I've seen seed companies valued, let's say, at $12 million. So in Silicon Valley, it's typically higher. If you come out of Y Combinator, Y Combinator has sort of given you their stamp of approval. They're going to be on the higher end. If you're just trying to raise money on your own, you're going to be the lower end. Uh, let's say that you raise $1 million on a $5 million pre-money valuation. You're giving up 20% of the company. So that's the way the math would work. Uh, Series A, uh, in fact, at each stage, you typically are giving up 20 to 25% of the company. So at Series A, the company, at that point, if you had if your, if your seed was at five million pre, six million post, uh, maybe the, a year later the company's doubled in value, so it's worth 12, maybe as high as 20 million. You raise five on 15. You're give, actually you're giving up a third of the company initially, so somewhere between 20 and 30 percent. Uh, and by the time you've gone through five stages, you've you've given up significant capital. What do you recommend right now during the, the time that the market is right now? Whether you're reading a, raising a seed or a, a Series A, do you? Raise as much as you can now, or um, give the market conditions, or, or, or and take a hit with the dilution, or, or what's your thought right now? Well, here's how I think about it. You, it's very disruptive to raise money. If, if you're spending a lot of time raising money, you're not building your product and getting customers. So you don't want to do it for very long, and you don't want to do it often. So the most you would want to do it is once a year. And so. Uh, what you want to do is you, you want to raise, so what that means by definition is whenever you're raising money now, you want it to last at least a year. So you put together a business plan and you say, here's how many people I think I'm gonna hire, here's what I think is gonna happen, you try to be a little conservative, and you say, worst case, how much cash will I need for the next year? That's the minimum amount you should raise. If times were good and you could raise more, you don't want to raise too much money because if you raise too much money now, you're for, you could wait and you could raise money a year or two or three years from now at a higher valuation. So there's a balance there. And the most, the furthest out I would go would be two years. Because if you're raising money that you're not going to spend for three or four years, you're, you're giving up too much valuation. So on the low end, I'd say raise at least a year's worth. On the high end, two years worth. And where you are between a year and two years depends on how easy it is to raise money and what the economic environment is. If it's really easy to raise money, raise two years worth. If it's really hard to raise money, just raise one year's worth and then wait, because a year from now, if you do well, you'll be able to raise more. Question on the front. Yeah, hi, my, my name is Marcus. Um, thank you. Um, we saw a great list of, of proven steps where you have to go through um, before you get funded. And you said with uh, Bessemer, you don't fund very early, you go later. So what I think is all, all the, the points are proven. There's uh, some founders and, they, and you say, wow, you, you, you go through all these points. But in one sentence you said, uh, sometimes you fail. So if everything is proven like this, um, why don't you have a 100% uh, <laughs> rate? And what is the biggest reason they fail, even if they got through all these points? That's a fantastic question. Our, our history is, uh, over the last 20 years of all the investments we've made, we've lost all our money in about a third of our deals. A third, one third. We've made between zero and two times our money in about a third of the deals, and then a third of the deals make more than two times our money, and of course the profits from that pays for all the losers. And we're in a risky business. That's the nature of venture capital. I have some friends in the private equity business. One friend of mine, had, his firm has done 100 deals. They've never lost all their money in any company. They have 100% of the time, they get at least some of their money back. So the private equity business, but they never make 10 to one returns either. They, you know, they're, they, they, we both try to make about three times our money. So on average, if we're investing a fund of a billion and a half dollars, we want to be able to make four and a half billion dollar return over the course of several years of the course of 100, 100 companies. Uh, but, uh, and the private equity firms also are trying to make three times their money, but they're doing it less risk, less reward. We're doing it more risk, more reward. Now to your question about the reasons, why would a company with $5 million of revenue that's growing 100% a year <coughs> fail? And the answer is, uh, frequently, it's a founder problem. There are two co-founders. They fight. They don't get along. One of them quits. There's disharmony in the company. 
people, they can't recruit new people because who wants to go to work for a company where the founders are fighting and everybody's feeling bad? Uh, they can't hire good engineers and they lose their competitive edge. They, maybe they had product market fit initially, but then they lose product market fit because the technology changes. You're a website and then mobile is invented and all your, all your customers move to mobile and you don't move fast enough to the next platform. Uh, maybe uh, you have uh, a new competitor come in or maybe an existing incumbent who didn't have a product launches a new product and all of a sudden and lowers price. Uh, so we had, uh, actually I, I was involved, with the worst investment decision I ever made uh, was a company called Oberon Media, which was a game company, which had, uh, they made uh, downloadable games that were sold on Yahoo and Microsoft game channels. So if you go to my, my msn.com, they would have new sports game, weather games. And you go to games, you could play uh, Bejeweled and games like that. You play for an hour for free, at the end of an hour it says now you have to put your credit card in and pay $19.95 to own the game. And we had $100 million in revenue in that business. And then Zynga came along and came up with free games on Facebook where over time you paid for little, you know, little animals and, and Farmville and things like that. And all the people who used to play, pay $20 to pay, play Bejeweled started playing Farmville and $100 million went to $20 million. And I think we lost, investors probably lost uh, $150 million. So it happens. Uh, there's, there's all sorts of reasons why companies can fail and it's, this is hard business. Maybe market conditions a little bit too. I think double click, right? That was, I mean, they were King Kong, they were 800 pound grill in that market space at that time. Well, that's true. Yeah, double click was the leading internet advertising technology provider in from the time internet advertising was created till uh, 2000, 2001. And after, when the, when the NASDAQ bubble burst and many companies couldn't raise capital and then after 9-11, the, the total dollar value of internet advertising dropped by about half. And our revenues dropped from 500 million down to 250 million. Uh, fortunately, I had been the CFO and I raised 700 million dollars in cash at the top of the market. So we had a very strong balance sheet all during the time our business was going, it was terrible. But the company was never threatened and ultimately it was bought, uh, it's now part of Google. But uh, th that's an extreme case where we had this, this incredible you know, crash where literally half our customers went out of business. Question back here. Hello. Uh, this is uh, regarding your earlier question regarding uh, how much to raise at each stage. Uh, so let's say I need only um, 500k uh, at this stage. Uh, but uh, I'm aware of the fact that an, any angel investor looks for at least 15 to 20 percent equity. Uh, so um, I, I'm aware of my company's valuation and I know I can raise 1 million for giving out 15 to 20 percent. So what do you suggest in that case? Uh, I need only 500k. Uh, but if I have to give my 15 percent, I would think, okay, let me raise 1 million if investor is ready to give that much. So what do you suggest in that case? Uh, let me repeat the question to make sure I understand it. You're saying you have investors who want a minimum of 15% of the company yeah. and they're willing to invest between 500,000 and a million. So your choice is either sell 15% of the company for half a million or 15% of the company for a million. Yeah. Well, that's, you've, you've answered the question. <laughs> uh, I think it's, in that case, that's, it's, it's clear that you might as well uh, sell more equity uh, to sell rather raise more money if you if you don't have to give up any more equity, but the the real answer is you want competition. So the market for investing is like any other market. There are buyers and sellers, and if you have more buyers, the price goes up, and if you have fewer buyers, the price goes down. So if you can find people who want two million dollars worth of your stock, but you're only selling one million, and you tell somebody, well, you sorry, but you you're out. You've lost because you're not. You're fifth on the list of five, uh, unless you give me a higher valuation. One of those, the guy who's at fifth might say, you know what, I'll, I'll give you a higher valuation. So if you can get more, you know, one or two more investors than you need to all be interested and get them to bid against each other, then you can set the terms. If you only have one investor, then the, that investor sets the terms. We have time for one more question here. So you have a very great, great 20 points. Uh, what? Uh, uh, the investors look in you. Uh, I am interested more in what do we need to look in the investors? Like uh, 20 things based on your past experience, 
like as a founder, what do I need to look at the investor? Hey, uh, is it a positive vibe or, or is they, uh, are they going to give their time or is it the uh, dollar amount? Because sometimes it's not the uh, dollar amount which is going to bring in the value for the company, it's the, uh, the connections or uh, the uh, go-to-market strategy they are being proven. Right. So what's your to uh, top three or four things? Okay, so the, I'll to repeat the question. The question is from an entrepreneur's point of view, if you have a chance of having several potential investors, how do you choose the best investor for you who's gonna add the most value? And what, what entrepreneurs typically want, uh, sometimes they want an experienced advisor who has seen things before who can help guide them and, and help them avoid mistakes or help them make the right decisions. In my experience, most entrepreneurs have very high opinions of their own judgment, and they really don't want advice. Uh, sometimes they do, but, but often they, they think they don't need it. Uh, what, I best, what they often want is they want introductions. They want connections to customers. Or, uh, so no, number one is, if it's a B2B, they want, uh, they want introductions to customers who can become paying customers. Number two is they want introductions to potential recruits. So recruiting is an extremely important function for investors, both whether it's an angel investor or, uh, or a, a venture capital firm. Uh, and then they also want to know that that investor will be there in the next round. So if you invest in a seed, you want to know does that investor have enough capital and willingness and interest to write another check and say I'm going to be supportive of you in your next round or your next round because that's a very good signal. And if your investor doesn't invest in the next round, it's actually a negative signal sometimes. Uh, so I think all of those things are important. You're getting these kinds, if someone invests in you today, the chances are you're still going to be partners five, six, seven, eight years from now. So it's like getting married. So, you know, if, if you're married to someone for eight years and you don't get along with them, that's a long time to be married in an unhappy marriage. So it's very, a very important thing is just do you get along with the person personally and do you feel like you can trust their judgment and, and you'll, you'll have a good relationship. So the question then is, well, how do you figure all this out? And the, the answer is, based on experience. So if someone is an experienced investor and they've made other investments in the past and you have the luxury of having a choice of investors, what you want to do is you want to talk to the CEOs of other companies they've invested in over the last several years, who've been with them for several years, and ask them those questions. Were they helpful? Did they bring in revenue? Did they help with recruiting? Were they a good advisor? Did, were they helpful to me when, when times got tough? And the most important thing to do, if you can, is to find a company that failed where that investor invested, and talk to the CEO of that company. Because if things have gone great, all the investors are good. It's only when things get tough, or when the company fails, where the conflict between the investor and the entrepreneur really show themselves. And you, you may still want to go with that investor, but you want to know. You want to go in with your eyes open. You want to know that this investor behaved in a certain way in that difficult situation a year or two ago. Thank you very much. It's really been a pleasure to be here.